the cadaver dissection course that we did. And I'm in the background with my eyes closed, clearly riveted. Um, so when I started residency, I knew about all the incredible reconstructive procedures that plastic surgeons did. We do breast reconstruction after uh, mastectomies. One in eight women in their lives will get breast cancer. So this is something that we do all the time. We also do lower extremity reconstruction. Plastic surgeons play a key role in preventing amputations in patients who have severe open fractures um, after motor vehicle accidents or motorcycle accidents. We do a lot of burn surgery. We have a couple of surgeons who take care of acute burns, and then we also take care of burn reconstructive needs at a later date for those patients. We also do um, cleft and craniofacial surgery in our pediatric population, and then we also do we take care of hand trauma, and a lot of um, we do a lot of elective hand operations as well. So that's what I was really familiar with coming here, coming from an academic center um, at Indiana, and then coming here. But what I had to learn a lot more about was cosmetic surgery, different types of implants you use for breast augmentation. What's Botox? What are fillers? Why do we use them? I didn't know any of that before I came here. Uh, facial cosmetic surgery, like the facelift in this uh, photograph, as well as body contouring procedures like this abdominoplasty. So within plastic surgery, you kind of have this, you kind of run the gamut as far as what we do. Clearly, it's a lot of different procedures, but on the left is more of the reconstructive operations that get people from some kind of deformity to a normal appearance, and then the aesthetic side, which takes you from a normal appearance to hopefully even better. And what I also began to realize was that private practice cosmetic surgeries run a lot like a business, probably more so than any other field of medicine. And um, that's accompanied by a large amount of advertising. People pay out of pocket for all cosmetic surgery. So plastic surgeons really have to uh, maintain competitive pricing, compelling advertising, and also a high quality product that can compete with the guy down the road. So there are considerable rules actually put in place by our professional societies that govern how you can advertise. There's an entire section on advertising in the Code of Ethics that, that's put out by the American Society of Plastic Surgeons. And because of technology advancements over the last two decades, a large amount of this advertising now takes place online. And so naturally, as social media has evolved, plastic surgeons began to use it for advertising purposes. So social media just refers to any websites or applications that are used to share content to participate in social networking. And for cosmetic plastic surgeons, it's often a great opportunity for advertising and for practice promotion. So in a diverse audience like this, I won't assume that everyone is very familiar with the various social media networks, but Facebook, one of the most popular social media platforms was launched in 2004 by Mark Zuckerberg. It was initially very exclusive and was only open to Ivy League students, but eventually, it expanded to include anyone with a college or university email address. Then it included high schools, and now anyone with any valid email address can be on Facebook. Uh, then Twitter was launched by Jack Dorsey in 2006, and this was primarily as a way to keep tabs on friends and what they're doing by status updates. They're kind of like texts. So on Facebook, there are multiple different functionalities, and only one of which is a status update, and Twitter was really just a status, and these are affectionately termed tweets. And then in 2010, Instagram was launched, which is really just um, pictures and videos that you can either elect to show to share publicly or privately when you create an account. You can have control over whether it's just people you know looking at your material or anyone can look at it if they can find you. And then last but certainly not least, that the app that I want to talk about is Snapchat. So this came out in 2011, and what's interesting about Snapchat is it allows for the sharing of photographs that disappear after a certain amount of time. And this became really attractive to teenagers, especially when their parents started flocking to Facebook in droves. And so Snapchat, actually, the initial name for it was Peekaboo, for obviously somewhat um, creepy reasons. But, and I quote, show off your sexy new hairstyle or let him choose that hot new outfit without the hassle and stress of knowing that these images will be saved into your camera gallery forever. So based on that, you, you, you know what kind of images are gonna be on Snapchat. So these are the top 15 most used social networking sites. Facebook is in the blue bar at the top, number one. And then the second most used is actually YouTube. And then the gray bar, which is number three, is Instagram. And number four is Twitter. I was very surprised that Snapchat was not on here. 
So how is social media valuable in medicine or for physicians more specifically? So it, it serves a lot of good purposes. Um, I'm not here to completely trash social media altogether. Um, it's good for networking. Um, it can also be very helpful for research collaboration. Um, it, within plastic surgery, it's really valuable for online journal clubs. Also, it can be used for career development. And sometimes it can be used for remote participation in professional meetings and conferences. Social media can also be harnessed for educational purposes, marketing and branding, which is where our cosmetic surgeons come in, and also sometimes for patient interactions. So where things can get a little bit sticky are with the marketing and branding purpose, definitely with patient communication, and then sometimes even with education. And as we'll see later, um, some physicians, some surgeons justify material that they post on social media as potentially educational. And so that's what makes it okay. So clearly not all physician social media engagement is bad, not by a long shot. This is our Facebook page um, for University of Michigan Plastic Surgery. And we have all sorts of stuff on there that, have nothing, that has nothing to do with patients. So um, a couple months back, we had photographs from our winter party just showing photographs of our staff and residents and faculty uh, socializing essentially. And we've also featured our two female faculty recently and their research accomplishments and interests. And then this one is actually just highlighting the medical students who we just matched for the upcoming academic year. So this is a lot of um, just highlighting faculty and resident uh, involvement in the program. This is Dr. Dimmick's uh, Twitter feed. He, Dr. Justin Dimmick is a minimally invasive surgeon here and he is a widely respected, hugely successful health services researcher here. And his Twitter feed has a lot on career development, career advice. He's retweeted some posts about match day and various posts featuring papers that have been published by general surgery attendings or residents. And he's also uh, posted about grand round speakers within general surgery. It really has nothing to do with patients. It's done really well. It's a, a good feed to follow. However, plastic surgeons who practice mostly cosmetic surgery um, have started to post pre and post-op photos of their patients. And of course, of course, they're getting consent from their patients to do this. And frankly, it can be done tastefully. Um, the, the post on the left is from the account of Dr. Rick Reich. He trained at Harvard and now is practicing cosmetic surgery in New York City. And he just posts a brief blurb basically about what this patient's preoperative needs were and at what time the postoperative photo was taken. And his photographs really conform to the usual um, American Board of Plastic Surgery photography standards. So it's done tastefully. Uh, the guy on the right, <laughs> His posts are um, usually questionable at best, but this particular one um, is actually conforms to our usual photography standards. He's showing the pre and post op results of an abdominoplasty. And, you know, we take photographs of all of our patients, and a lot of plastic surgery patients, especially cosmetic surgery patients, want to know what these patients look like before and after. And they flock to the internet as a source of information for potential cosmetic surgeons. So, um, in fact, uh, a large percentage of patients uh, surveyed have said that the internet does function as a valuable resource for evaluating plastic surgeons and understanding potential surgical procedures. Um, so these board certified plastic surgeons, Dr. Reich, Dr. Oppenheimer, they're really just meeting patients where they're at, which in today's culture is online, um, social media. And 60% of plastic surgeons who have been surveyed feel that social media use is really inevitable because of today's culture. And they feel that it's really beneficial for the maintenance of a surgical practice. And so some surgeons, and rightly so, feel that failing to meet patients online renders us obsolete and may lead patients down a path towards less qualified cosmetic surgeons. And what I mean by that is there's a considerable number of um, practitioners on social media who declare themselves to be cosmetic surgeons but are not actually plastic surgery trained. It becomes a little weird, a little distasteful, however, when trained medical doctors start to use social media to build personal brands. So this is a plastic surgeon who uh, is practicing in Beverly Hills. She not only posts fairly narcissistic photos of herself, but she also 
post photographs and videos of invasive procedures. So on several occasions, she has posted photographs of skin and fat that she's removed from patients' bodies. And the caption here, which a lot of you probably can't read is, I like to call this flames of fat. So this is the type of post that um, we are referring to when we condemn sensationalism, which is kind of becoming, it seems to be more and more acceptable to some of our junior attendings and even trainees. And so it, again, it's the purpose is to kind of shock and awe and draw people in that way um, and often exploits patients in the process. So again, presumably she's obtaining consent from patients to post photos like this, but it's my guess that patients are saying, sure, take, take a photograph of my procedure or my specimen, but sh they probably don't know that she's saying, I call this flames of fat. So um, while some surgeons and patients feel like it's okay to post intraoperative videos, we also have some surgeons who are posting videos and photographs that sensationalize the female genitalia. So this is um, the Snapchat account of one of our graduates actually. And um, he actually uh, trained in craniofacial surgery but now does a bunch of labiaplasties down in Orlando. So I don't know how that transition occurred, but it did. Um, <laughs> so. Anyway, some of his posts are just shy of pornographic, and that's why I won't be showing them here. But uh, some of his videos, as you can see, I, well, you may not be able to read it, but he has live labiaplasty and vaginal tightening procedures on Snapchat, at Real Dr. Op. So if you're super curious, that's how you can follow him. So, um, so obviously he's on Snapchat, this material disappears after a certain amount of time. And because of this time sensitivity, these kinds of posts become really, really difficult to regulate and keep track of. And anyway, I'm so glad that we as plastic surgeons are submitting to one high standard. That's part of our logo for the ASPS. So after seeing this wide variety of social media posts and various levels of engagement, I started to wonder, should doctors, should surgeons be on social media at all? I'm a plastic surgery resident, so I care a lot about uh, the surgeon population. And I came to realize that social media can be used again for a lot of good purposes and also actively managing your online presence can help you kind of weed through the mire of potentially negative or false information that the internet might have about you. And so those are good things. So I think technically it's fine for us as medical doctors to be on social media. But even though the crazy cosmetic surgeons are largely plastic surgery's problem, there's still a very real danger regardless of your specialty of your tone being badly misinterpreted by your patients and their families. So of course the risk of privacy breaches um, are always present and they, they have to be absolutely avoided, but what are the more subtle nuances? Can we post whatever we want as long as the patient gives consent or as long as the information is de-identified? So Nick Berlin and I, uh, he's one of the other plastic surgery residents alongside Dr. Verkler conducted a systematic review of the surgical literature just to find is there anybody who is commenting specifically on what social media content is professional? So we use the usual databases and we focus primarily on themes involving social media and professionalism. And then we also perform manual searches of the uh, three highest impact plastic surgery journals. So we really just wanted to look for studies that pertain directly to clinical medicine, patient care, and also social media. And the only studies that we included for um, for full text review had to do with surgery. So we reviewed a bunch of titles and abstracts and we ended up including about 36 papers in our qualitative synthesis from both our initial search and our manual search with, um, uh, in the plastic surgery journals. So what did we find? Which surgical specialties have contributed? So interestingly, urology actually contributed the most significantly to this area of literature. We also found papers written by general surgeons, found some by plastic surgeons, orthopedic surgeons, as well as vascular surgeons. So like I said, urology, the urology literature was by far the most robust and they actually have official guidelines from some of their professional societies, which is um, more than I can say for plastic surgery. And they really emphasized, again, protecting patient confidentiality. That seems like a no brainer, but it, it, it's really not. 
And they also recommend avoiding direct contact with patients on social media, which again is tends to be controversial within um, at least my field. They also recommend separating your professional and personal accounts. So you have a personal account that maybe you interact with your peers, your friends, and a professional account where your patients can follow you. So if you wanna post something on your personal account about, I went to this political rally or I went to this church event, more controversial topics that maybe you don't want your patients to see for any number of reasons, then they're not gonna see it. And there are multiple benefits uh, with that for that approach. Interestingly, at plastic surgery meetings, they actually advise the opposite. They For building a brand, they think that these two should be merged. But the other surgical subspecialties really disagreed with that in our search. So the European Association of Urology um, provided some pretty general guidelines as well. Um, refrain from self-promotion, which is like the antithesis of social media as a whole. Um, and then they also strongly recommended against accepting friend requests from patients. Two principles that we're going to see over and over again that the urology literature really highlighted is that your audience is potentially infinite. You really don't know who's going to be viewing your posts, and your posts are permanent. Once they're in the cybersphere, it's next to impossible to retract them. So specifically with regard to content, urology encourages the use of disclaimers, meaning Whatever condition or symptoms that I'm talking about today or on this post may not directly apply to you. Don't take this as medical advice. Um, declare conflicts of interest. And again, be professional, be courteous, basically be polite. And um, you may want to include that your opinions don't necessarily reflect those of the institution. So she thinks this isn't very specific about exactly what makes a post professional versus not. The so general surgery was uh, similar, had similar themes. Um, they really recommended staying aware of social media platforms policies, which can actually be hard to do because they're, they're not all the same and they change rapidly um, with regard to privacy. Also, they mentioned a really important um, principle, uh, the, the physician-patient power differential, which we'll get into later, which basically just means that as physicians, we often just have more power than our patients. And so sometimes patients are going to consent to just about anything if they trust us, um, especially if we're doing an operation on them. So they're going to, it's likely that they will consent to social media posts, even if they feel uncomfortable about it. Actively manage your online presence, use the highest privacy settings. This also is in conflict with what we hear at plastic surgery meetings to use the lowest privacy settings so that all your patients can find you. And again, remember your potential audiences are often much larger than you think, and posts are permanent. In the, once they're in the cybersphere, they're there forever. So for content specifically, avoid HIPAA violations. Again, seems like a no-brainer, and maintain the profession's reputation. Could you be any more vague? <laughs> so with, in the vascular surgery literature, we only found one paper, and they really cautioned that patients, once they realize you're on social media, they may start to rely on social media to communicate important information. Uh, like, I can't come to this clinic appointment, or I have an urgent concern, um, an urgent post-op concern. So just be aware of that. And then to start with one platform at a time, get familiar with it, do it well before you expand to using multiple plat platforms at once. But they didn't really say anything specifically on content. So the orthopedic surgery literature, again, pretty similar themes. You see, again, the recommendation to keep your personal and professional accounts separate. Um, definitely a good idea to avoid initiation of the doctor-patient relationship online. Sometimes if a patient um, contacts you about a condition or a procedure that you've posted about, it's really important to immediately recommend um, a, a clinic appointment, a consultation, rather than starting to give them advice um, over the internet. That can, especially if that's occurring across state lines, that can potentially result in litigious consequences. And obviously, follow institutional policies if they exist and obtain consent. So on content, keep your medical advice general. This is also in line with using disclaimers and making sure that patients don't think that whatever you're posting directly applies to their condition or their symptoms. And then avoid communicating personal health information over social media. Those venues are not secure. So again, super helpful with regard to content. Then you move to the plastic surgery literature where you find some of the biggest social media cheerleaders. So, <clears throat> I recommend consent for both identifiable and de-identified material. And that's really important because in the past, people have been fired over posting um, 
pictures of patients in the, in the operating room or pictures of their specimens, even though they're de-identified, um, they didn't have consent for that. And plastic surgery, which I think this is actually really good. They have suggested developing a social media consent form because the risks of social media are very unique um, uh, to facilitate fully informed consent, a form that adequately addresses all those risks is really important for patients before they sign up for this. And obviously balance competing interests of the patient and the surgeon. I don't really think that's a balance. I think you always put the patient first, but um, that's what it said. So um, again, I would wanna highlight the, the last two potentially infinite audience when you're posting and your posts are permanent. So with regard to content, this was also very general as well and was somewhat in line with what the other subspecialties had said. Um, but these were also really vague and not as helpful as I was hoping they would be. So... So I want to review the, the key findings that we had from this from our synthesis of the literature. So um, we clearly have to protect um, patient privacy and confidentiality. So HIPAA applies on social media too. Again, that sounds like a no-brainer, but um, it's really important to emphasize that. But you know, HIPAA violations can still sometimes occur. Sometimes there have been occasions where, um, you know, let's say a really unique trauma comes in and a general surgery resident decides to post about the operation that they do for that patient. Well, it's very likely that if it's a unique trauma situation that that would have been on the news and potentially the victim's name would have been on the news. And so all of a sudden that post becomes very readily identifiable. So you have to be really, really careful. Also, um, social media interactions with patients. <laughs> These interactions cannot substitute for the doctor patient encounter. So general medical knowledge or education provided over social media, if not accompanied by appropriate disclaimers, can be misconstrued as medical advice and potentially lead to litigious consequences. So again, surgeons or physicians in general can begin online communications with patients and inter inadvertently begin that doctor-patient relationship, which really needs to take place in the usual clinical encounter. So I've mentioned these already, but I just wanna emphasize them again. So these are kind of the key tenants that, that should go into uh, a specific consent form for social media for patients. So surgeons, again, and physicians in general, um, may assume the ear of a specific audience, but their audience may actually be much larger than they think. And the reason why this is important is one in five Snapchat users are between the ages of 13 and 17. And six in 10 Instagram users fall between the ages of 18 and 25. So this really matters because teenagers, the 14-year-old boy that lives next door to you is not going to process photographs of breasts and genitalia like your plastic surgery colleague would as they're reading about a procedure in a plastic surgery journal. Patients need to understand that. Also, you really relinquish control over your posts. And I, what I want to hone in on again is that they're permanent. Once they are in the cybersphere, it's virtually impossible to delete them. And it's highly likely that a lot of patients don't appreciate that. And it's probably not fully explained every time that surgeons are getting consent to post their material, their videos, their photographs on social media. And the reason why this is important is this is the consent form that we actually use for uh, plastic surgery photography. So it's hard to read probably from where you're sitting, but these three different options um, represent different venues where photographs can be shown. So the first one is just basically for education, for like educational conferences within the institution. The second one is to show photographs to other patients who may be going through similar procedures in the future. And then the third one is for educational purposes outside the university, like national meetings. So this form is contingent on the fact that surgeons have control over these photographs. And that is not at all the case with social media. And so patients, again, need to understand that. So in the process of facilitating fully informed consent, they need to understand that posts are permanent, that we lose control over their material once it's online, and that anyone can view it, anyone can repost it, and it can go viral without our say on, in the matter. Also, it's probably very prudent to allow patients the opportunity to see the photographs and videos you plan to post, and then obtain consent afterwards. <laughs> Also, we recommend avoiding consent for social media at the time of surgery. 
it really kind of conflates uh, the trust that the patient has in the surgeon to do the right operation with their trust that the patient will, or that the physician will also do the right thing with their images. So what constitutes unprofessional content? Um, we still don't have the exact answer to that. And that is, that's why we're here. That's the difficult question. And that was um, really clear in just the gaping uh, lack of information about it in our literature review. So um, while the Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart fam famously said, I know it when I see it, when referring to pornography, determining the appropriateness of social media content just isn't as obvious to some. So while many surgeons, many plastic surgeons, post photographs and videos in a legally compliant fashion by obtaining consent, the nature of the post may still be unprofessional and even unethical and may fail to reflect well on the profession and the surgeon as a whole. So as a result, consent is always necessary, but it's really insufficient for evaluating if the content itself is professional or not. So one aspect of professionalism, which is one of our core competencies in medical training, is to have the ability to communicate and interact in a respectful and productive manner. And the AMA actually released guidelines on social media several years ago, and which recommended that physicians have to recognize that their actions online may negatively affect reputations, have consequences for their careers, and also undermine public trust in the medical profession. And so clearly some plastic surgeons, some general surgeons, some neurosurgeons are failing to communicate in a respectful and productive manner that reflects well on their respective fields and colleagues. So social media engagement, like the, the posts that I've shown you, really undermines the reputation of plastic surgery. And as the culture evolves, we're gonna need new guidelines um, in order to help preserve patients' trust and protect public opinion. And actually the public opinion um, is not that great of plastic surgery. They really don't have a, a, a good understanding of what we do and the kind of patients we take care of. So the kind of sensational posts that some of our cosmetic surgeons are posting are certainly not helping with that. And also just, in general, physicians are, we are part of a profession, and as such, we have submitted to um, a higher standard of behavior and a more stringent ethical code, and really our social media engagement should reflect that higher standard. Also, as a profession, we should be characterized by some degree of self-regulation. I don't think that we should really require outsiders to tell us how to be professional and have integrity. We should be able to manage that within our own ranks. So what does it mean to be a professional? Part of that is just possessing knowledge, setting standards for our performance and fulfilling a societal need and also clearly practicing ethically is paramount. And part of that is acting in the other's best interest. That means the patient and that may mean not posting something that just that promotes your practice at the expense of the patient. So some plastic surgeons um, have protested any additional or any regulations on social media at all. Um, the results of this literature review we've submitted to one of our our highest impact journal. And the reviews were very, very interesting. Um, they really don't want uh, anyone negatively talking about social media and the implications that certain um, types of posts can have. And one of their, one of their um, objections is that, you know, we have First Amendment rights, we can say whatever we want, but should we? Um, you know, we impose common sense limitations over our speech every day that benefits us, our families, our patients. And so while we do have the freedom in this country to say anything we want, should we? I don't think so. So the conflict that and the tension that a lot of plastic surgeons and cosmetic surgeons feel really um, comes from this tension between the, the advertising and entertainment culture that we have in this country and then um, and the limitations, the common sense limitations and self-regulation that we should be imposing on ourselves. So for years, advertising has used sexuality to sell products. And as such, there's a real pressure to create a culture of transparency in cosmetic surgery to attract patients. And so this often results in attempts by cosmetic surgeons to deliver material that is titillating, provocative, and sometimes nearly pornographic in order to fill empty seats in their waiting rooms. So in lieu of this pressure to conform to the advertising standards of our culture, we have this phenomenon of medutainment. This was originally coined by the emergency department um, or by um, emergency medicine literature, not the emergency department here. Um, but what is this? So it's the use of the surgeon patient relationship as a source of entertainment under the guise of education. And so this really demeans the surgeon's primary protect protective duty towards the patient. 
And if we promote any and all methods of advertising without carefully considering common sense, sensible standards, the, the merchant model or the buyer beware easily overrides our foundational commitment to, to do no harm, premium non necessary. So this being justified as education as a post-op result, I don't, I don't think it's justifiable. That is not education. But what about this? Is this educational? Uh, this is a post from a neurosurgeon, actually. He was taking photos of a glioblastoma resection. So I would, I guess I would suggest that this, po this post is a freak show to the casual observer. So as many of us know, when you've got medical students coming into the operating room for the first time as they're in their third year clerkship, a lot of them, or in some of, some of us did the same thing when we were, when we were in their shoes. You know, we see body parts for the first time, we see brains, we see hearts, and we say, whoa, that's so cool, can I touch that? And <clears throat> if that's how medical students respond to a human brain, then how do you think a lay person might respond to an image like this? Also, when we decide on acceptable content, context carries considerable weight as well. So photo or a painting of breasts in an art gallery or breasts, um, in a park during breastfeeding or in a plastic surgery journal or pornography or a surgeon's Snapchat account. These are all imbued with very different meanings and can be processed and perceived differently. So society often sexualizes the body depending on context. Um, you know, plastic surgeons reading a plastic surgery journal, highly unlikely for that to happen, but a social media post like that one on the right that is visible to anyone that can find real doctor up, probably gonna be sexualized and patients need to understand that. So we have to ha take some responsibility for these images that we post or the information that we post. Just because a patient gives consent doesn't mean that you know, that frees us from all responsibility about how to handle, handle these images appropriately. And then I wanted to touch on the doctor-patient power differential again. This was brought up in the general surgery literature. And this is a picture, a photograph of Henry Beecher, the father of peer review. Um, he, is the, he was the author of an article written over 50 years ago entitled Ethics and Clinical Research. And he really felt that most patients will do just about anything a physician asks of them just out of genuine trust. So given that posting patient photographs or videos is physically harmless, it's probable that even hesitant patients are going to consent to the posting of their material on social media, especially if it helps their affable cosmetic surgeon who's just who's about to do a really cool procedure on them, you know, and it kind of implies almost a, a bargain um, that they feel like they have to live up to. And so um, fully informed consent, enumerating all the risks of social media, and also reassuring the patient that the care that you provide for them will not be affected whatsoever by their consent to social media can help mitigate this power differential. Also, patients should never be incentivized to consent to social media publication of sensitive material. Interestingly enough, there are some cosmetic surgeons who provide discounted procedures, discounted cosmetic procedures to patients who will consent to their material being published on social media. So while we have, focused a lot on cosmetic plastic surgeons here. Um, it's easy, they're an easy target and I'm a plastic surgery resident. So, but there's a real sense in which social media just feeds our general tendency to narcissism. So social media is a medium that is very curated and stylized and most of us don't go to social media and post photographs of us the second that we wake up in the morning. And we don't post photographs of our kids uh, misbehaving or whatnot. We post the best, um, the best views of ourselves. And so this isn't just, this isn't just um, surgeons who are doing this. Um, and the vast majority of these posts, um, when they are posted by medical doctors, they are just extremely distasteful. Um, but when patients are then also unwittingly exploited or objectified in certain ways, um, that really crosses the line into impermissibility. So this is another post from the same neurosurgeon as the one who posted the glioblastoma resection. And he, um, I, I, I've talked a, a fair amount about separating your professional from your personal accounts. He definitely doesn't do that. 
So this was either right before or right after the post of his glioblastoma resection. And um, it's just him driving his Porsche at an F1 track. And his hashtag says Porsche Club of America. So if this isn't pure narcissism used to meditate the masses, I don't know what is. Um, <laughs> so what should underlie all of these principles that we talked about? Well, clearly prioritizing the interests of the patient over our own, prioritizing um, making sure the patient is not exploited in an effort to promote our own practices. So the manner in which some of these surgeons handle a patient's tissue and other information really lacks dignity and respect. So the purpose of some of these posts are clearly to sensationalize or shock and awe an audience. And these goals are very often pursued at the expense of the patient. So I just want to summarize key takeaways. So we need to facilitate fully informed consent and patients need to understand that posts are permanent and that we really have no control over who's viewing these posts. It may be my fellow plastic surgery resident or it may be the 14 year old boy down the street. We need to self-regulate. We need to figure out how to appropriately engage with social media as a profession um, before someone from the outside has to intervene, which I think is a very real option in lieu of some of the videos and photographs that I see online. <clears throat> Context matters. Entertainment doesn't pass as education. We have to remember the doctor-patient power differential and do everything we can to mitigate that effect. And obviously, check your intent, check your motives um, when posting on social media, especially if it um, has anything to do with patients. And then again, the patient's interest should always outweigh our own. And the reason why doing it correctly is important. I want to circle back. Social media is not all bad. A lot of our patients are online. It's really important that we adapt to the culture. We need to remain relevant. And I think that's especially important in plastic surgery because again, a lot of the non-board certified plastic surgeons who are calling themselves cosmetic surgeons online um, are meeting these patients in this venue and providing inaccurate information for those patients. Um, so that's basically what I was alluding to here. We need to be there to provide the right information for patients who are looking. But I think we need clearer direction on how to accomplish this culture of transparency without um, sacrificing our integrity, without exploiting our patients in the process. So I'm gonna open this up to be a little more interactive. Um, hopefully a lot of you have thoughts about how to engage in social media appropriately. So how do you feel about something like this? A photograph of a chest X-ray being posted on Twitter asking you know, anyone who's following you, what's your diagnosis? Is this okay? Does a patient need to give consent for this type of material? Any thoughts? Yeah? Okay, why do you think it's fine? Sure. Anyone else? Yeah. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yes. Sure. <clears throat> yeah, I, I agree. And I, that's, you know, that's why we're talking about this because, you know, this is, uh, some of this is gray. And so people will have different opinions for sure. Um, I think based on our review of the literature, I do think even though this uh, seems harmless and it's at, at this point in time, unlikely to be identifiable, uh, it's, you're probably safest to at least obtain consent. And then again, I would recommend showing this to the patient before you post it um, and before you obtain consent from them. So I am guessing that you cannot see the captions. So I will read them to you. These are both posts from Scott Steele. Uh, he's a general surgeon. But the first one is, the loop ileostomy won't reach. What are your tricks? Next move. And then the bottom right is, um, 
79 year old male from nursing home presents with lower bowel obstruction, Parkinson's dementia, but otherwise healthy, no resolution with conservative slash endoscopic techniques in OR find below. How do you proceed? So are these posts just distasteful? Are they unprofessional or are they unethical? What are your thoughts? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> that would be, I don't know, I would be mm -hmm. I don't know, I know that's a little scary. For sure. Yeah, I agree. I think, like, you, this image was not on Twitter or whatever. And you were in the journal club and you were like, oh, this is where we were in the surgery, you know, yeah. and you were in a conference. This is where we were in the surgery to your fellow surgeons. Okay, residents, what would you do next? It's not the surgeon, so you know, I think I, you can see doing it that way. But um, in a social media context, this seems horrible and identifiable on the right, probably, mm -hmm. based on where right. this guy's geographic yeah. location is and all the specifics he put in the post. Yeah. Um, but also in terms of and is denigrating the confidence that patients have in physicians in general. Um, that exactly like that. Like if, I, if you're if I'm, if I'm crowd surfing for how to treat this patient while I'm in the OR, <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't build confidence of physicians in or patients and physicians in general. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think because this is on social media and anyone could respond, like I can't tell if he's like actually asking for advice or it's more like the the Twitter one, like, what would you do in this situation? Um, but anyone can respond who's not qualified, who's making a joke, who is qualified but has the wrong idea, and then it kind of provides a platform for that misinformation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, platform for misinformation and also for, like, ongoing degrading comments about, I mean, patients place, I, I don't know, that... There are any other specialties where you place so much implicit trust in someone than when you're being rolled back into the operating room and someone's going to cut you open. Um, and the fact that this is what they're doing and this is what they're doing with, you know, the patient's um, int or intestines, their specimen. So, okay. <clears throat> um, so this is more from the neurosurgeon. So the right post, uh, said, or actually they both say something similar, uh, successful removal of deep-seated brain tumor. I use 3D track finding al algorithms to spare the fibers controlling speech and movement. So is this okay to be posting specimens of a tumor? Is it different than posting imaging like on the left? Is there a, a gradation of what's okay and what's not? And before um, anyone answers, um, again, the next post, <laughs> the next post is this guy on an F1 track. So, yeah, thoughts? Yes. Mm -hmm. My message works, but then I do see a difference. 
Sure, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Hopefully not. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I. That's a great point about just potential for misuse. How different images have varying levels of that. Um, okay, and last but definitely not least, um, we have live videos that I will not be showing of <clears throat> vaginal tightening procedures using the vajazer. This is for real. Um, <clears throat> on, so on Snapchat, a video has been posted today of a Spanish-speaking woman in the stirrups, and the plastic surgeon is repeatedly inserting a vaginal probe while describing the benefits of a tighter vagina. Patient gave consent, so what's the big deal? Is this merely just a matter of opinion or is something like that always un unethical or unprofessional? Yep. <laughs> Yeah. 
I'm going to, so I want to add a follow-up question too. Um, you know, should plastic, a plastic surgery society intervene in some way, like, or should some sort of governing body start um, trying to contact physicians like this and, and prohibit posts like this? So, but again, other thoughts are fair game too. I just wanted to bring that up. Yes, go ahead. The, the, excuse me, the body thing as well. I mean, if consent is given, play something, is that Sure. Yeah, not far enough. Sorry. I mean, like, you know, that seems very strange to me, but I mean, maybe, you know, maybe some people actually are okay with, or not maybe, I mean, like, it's possible people are really okay with their bodies being objectified or used for uh, advertising. I don't know. But the reason there's so much leeway for parental consent is because people don't have fiduciary duties to those people to interact with it, but they're acting in their best interest, right? So, researchers, we can't do with any. Huh. Someone in the back. Sorry, I wanted to. Yeah, he's done that before. Yeah, <laughs> in the back. Yeah. I also can't help but wonder, kind of going off the lines of the king's occupation, in addition to anything can happen, this is live streaming, so you can't predict or anticipate what might be shown to a large audience, but also in terms of patient safety and the possibility of error. I mean, clearly it's a distraction. I would hope that he's not the one physically filming it, but even so, who's going to talk to this camera, who's aware of the camera, because it's the primary focus isn't on the patient, it's mm -hmm. on the well being. Yeah, sure. Yes. So I think I have to agree. We've seen like some very extreme examples compared to some of the ways they challenges patients that are made about social media and medicine. Um, for example, coverage of brand 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 on social media. Uh, there is consistent like use of sort of a guess the diagnosis uh, on social media. Um, so there are probably some more sort of common questions um, that happen more often than these sort of, you know, live surgeries um, that, I, that I feel like physicians could really use some answers uh, about um, and the first mm -hmm. as they use social media to educate to learn, and it's not just residents who are learning from social media. Attending physicians right. are learning from each other using social media, whether that's from Cruz or Twitter. I, I doubt they're going on Twitter in the middle of surgery. Oh, how are they? But you probably are following what I mean. So this is rather extreme, and there's really common questions that uh, communicators and physicians are really trying to figure out when it comes to um, using social media every day. The amazing things that are happening. Sure. Yeah, and again, the um, you know, our like, you know, like, 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 like
it said the uh the or the case in the word that and so it was Yeah. Yeah. Social media is definitely not all bad. It's just, um, you know, what are the gradations of appropriateness, especially once you start including patient information and patient photographs. So we are over time. Thank you so much for coming. I appreciate it.